Hi, how are you doing? Hi, everyone. Hi, Rach. Okay, so we have a couple minutes. Let's log into Canvas, download the notes and their assignment. We'll do those together. Devin, did you have a question? Oh, no. My mic was just not muted. <laughs> All right. Understand. How are you doing? Good. Okay. All right. Let me go to the dashboard here. Let's check out Canvas. Uh, take a look. So I'm going to use the chapter three notes in uh, a little bit of the PowerPoint, not so much PowerPoint. I'm not a PowerPoint person. And then also the assignment, we're going to address that today. Okay. And then on Thursday, I will lecture on the lab. So let's access your module for week two. We'll give everybody a minute or so. Hope you guys had a good long weekend. Catch up with sleep and work, right? <clears throat> Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so today we are going to go over the assignment, but we are going to mostly talk about our notes. You can find your unit two notes here. You can download them or you can view them within the page, right? So I'm going to go over um, these two along with, I uploaded some of the PowerPoint presentation in case you're in, interested. And then I also put a link. Let me reopen this. So what I did was I supplemented um, based on what the PowerPoint in the book, what it gives you, okay? Some of this I covered in uh, CIS 7, but this class is um, mostly different. Then CIS 7 as we cover assembly and organization and architecture in this class. So the focus for most of our lecture is about the CPU. And when you work with the low level programming, you really have to take a look at what type of processor that you're working with. And that's going to really tell you the requirement of the instructions in assembly. And in the last lecture, um, or when we did the lab exercises, we talked about- This is way how, better than having the class in person. How the, the organizational structure for the risk, which is reduced instruction set, is really using um, instructions and, and storage compared to SIS. So today's focus is going to be on your transistors and gates and how your logical operators are at work when you're programming, even on the higher level. So the beginning of the, the chapter, it talks about it talks about transistors. And so hold on, hold on one second. 
All right, thank you. Um, and and if you're looking at today's processor, like if you go out and purchase an Intel or AMD or even when you buy an Xbox, right, game console, um, all of the things that we use have a processor, uh, including our smartphone. And so what I want to bring your attention to is what we're going to talk about is Moore's Law and how that's relating to what we're going to be learning in this class. And I put a link on your notes about transistor count. So if you look at the definition of the transistor, it is simply an electronic device that is on the processor. We mostly use this for storage in the microprocessor. And if you're looking at a lot of different type of cache memories, which is used for temporary storage, right? Um, it really consists of the memory cell that is the same as some of the components that you see that's used for storage. So in 2022, if you're looking at your USB flash drive or your, your micro SD, right? These already, we are in the billions of your transistors. So what does the transistor really look like? right? It would be like this. Some are smaller, some are larger. And so it is just a way to amplify and switch electrical signal, right, in your CPU. And so this is a way that we can apply current or voltage for our digital signal. And so some of you probably heard of like you know, um, this course has, you know, had a little bit of emphasis in, in digital electronics, right? So, because if you're looking at the computer processor, it is really an integrated circuit. And the way it's built is with billions of transistors. And this is the larger size transistor. But when we look at the, the inside the processor, that will be a lot smaller. So coming down to the historical facts, right? If we're looking at the beginning record of your transistor, how it's integrated, let's say in the 70s, something like Intel, the earlier Intel, the actual physical size and the implementation. But if you're looking at the transistor count, that was 188. So this comes back to how we use storage and the demand for storage as we go along. And so keep that in mind. Fast forward, right? Let's say that we are looking at some of you are born in the, two, in the 2000s or even earlier in the 90s, right? So if you're looking at some of the system, for example, AMD K5, that was about 17,000. And if we're moving forward to more of the modern system, and so if you can see this list goes on because we have so many processors that we, we have used in the past. So um, let me find something that you're more familiar with. And then they also list it on the memory. So if you're working with like the actual hardware, you can have a better understanding of like uh, how RAM uses transistors. And so there are many different type of integrated circuits that's designed. And ultimately we use transistor, which gives us the logical component. That's what you use for programming to be able to compute, right? Ultimately the computer adds, right? We talked about using two's complement. And so it only adds the two's complement to make it a subtract. I had lost some of the, let me see. All right, so let's take a look at the Apple M2, which is pretty new in the market. And so they don't really have the actual count for these, but if you're looking at something that's in that family, right? Um, or even in the era, so the M1, you're looking at 135 billion. And so why the need for so many resistors? transistors. It's because we need to be able to store more. We're able to store more information and use that information to really compute and output values, right? Like for example, for analytics, um, 
for different computational purposes or even gaming. And even if you're looking at some of the GPU, so the AMD Epic, right, this, right, they don't have the count, but prior to that, the M1, so you're looking at about 135 billion um, and so on, okay, or million. And then, so when we compare this compared to the early 90s and, and, and 70s or the 80s, we have a huge growth right, in how we implemented transistors in our integrated circuit system, okay. So with that said, I'm going to switch here, and I'm going to come back to our chapter three notes. So to break this down, transistor is your basic element in the integrated circuits. It's a way that we can bring in the current or the voltage to the processor. And so if you imagine like a, in a home, you would have a light and you would have a wall switch. You need to have a current or some kind of power source going to that wall switch, which is the controller, to be able to send right the electrical signal to your light. And so with that simple concept, what we would have is we would think about how your electric circuits is integrated. So when we need to power something, we need to either use a battery or some form of power source, right? In your home, you would use your home power, which is then either generated from solar um, or it would be sent from the grid. So in your gates, you would think about how the gates is integrated from the source, which is your power source, and how it's going to drain. Okay, and this is an example of your N type, and we're going to talk about that shortly. So for the quiz and the final exam, you need to know what a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor is, a MOSFET. This is your simple component that's integrated for the gates inside your microprocessor. So the transistor that we looked at, some of them are PNP or some of them are NPN, that could be very, but ultimately it is a metal oxide semiconductor. So when they produce processor, right, let's say that you are AMD or Intel, you really need to take a look at the materials and the components that really made into an integrated circuit which is your, M, your semiconductor. Your, and for our transistors, it is metal oxide semiconductor, hence MOS. And so if some of those of you who build PC, you're probably familiar with CMOS battery, right? It's a type of battery, like a very flat, kind of like watch battery that use on the older system to really power your motherboard. And so with that, we already familiar with metal oxide semiconductor. And so the transistors, the way it's designed is it's really a way for us to layer the semiconductor as in slices. Think of it like sandwich, right? So your wafer is really representing semiconductor layers with the crystal of the silicon in Silicon Valley, right, where computing is really exploded in the 80s and you would have the web. And so we would layer the silicon dioxide to really create, right, what you see as a transistor along with a layer of metal, hence the name metal oxide semiconductor. And so in this class, we're going to focus on two types, your P-type and your N-type. And so here I would give you a little bit more information about how silicon dioxide is a good insulator. And that's why it's a good choice for the material because as you know, processor runs hot, right? And so we have to find a way to use the material with higher temperature. And so the layer will really allow the transistor to be a semiconductor as it is also a good insulator for and very thin to be able to build into something that's compact that is able to tolerate high temperature. For this, the transistor, 
when we look at the metal, there are certain region that would use your polycrystalline silicone or hence the name poly to be able to integrate what we see as gates. Okay, so the diagram would look like this. This is your n-type substrate. So the three main regions for the transistor, you need to know that there are three. Coming back to the earlier diagram, you need to have a source, a gate, and a drain. Okay. All right. So I'm going to pause here. All right. I'm going to go to the assignment. Let's answer some of the questions. Let's go to number one. And I designed these questions to have to give you a clearer picture of what a microprocessor is. I know all of you use computer, right? Many of you use, you know, uh, build computers and very familiar with the technology. But in this class, we have to think about how we see programming from the lens of the processor, okay? So we need to really know what is it made of? and how is it able to determine logic? So number one, describe the function of the transistor in the microprocessor. So we can define a, a CPU, central processing unit, or your microprocessor is an integrated circuit. It is consists of transistors, and today we talked about transistor, diodes, capacitors, resistors, and sometime inductor. So those are the major components that go into your processor. And this is consists of gate, source, and drain, right? We have diodes, capacitor, and resistor. This is used to regulate current, right? And then there are other components. So I will come back to this in a little bit and we'll talk about microcontroller and embedded system. So your transistor are made up of logic gates. And these are used as a switch. They're flip-flops so that way signal can be ones and zeros, okay? As we would have next to zero or zero voltage for off, and between 2.4 to 5 volts for on. And so why do we need really the gates? They are used to make combination circuits, right? While flip-flops are used to make sequential circuits. And we're going to come back to this next week. What's the difference between combination circuits and sequential circuits? So gates are used to make combination circuits and sequential circuits, and they are different. And so with these circuits, that's when we would make different building blocks of your microprocessor for arithmetic logic unit. This is the computational part of your microprocessor and other components. So when you apply a condition at a higher level, for example, in C++, we say, if this and this, we're going to execute this, right? So how is it going to determine if something is true and something is else also is true, right? With that, it needs to be able to determine that using the logical components, right, for computation, which is ultimately digital signal at zero and ones because the computer only understand binary. So it needs to break that down to your binary, right? Zero and ones to be able to compute it. And ultimately it sees everything as values. So with that, we have to have the hardware, right? As integrated circuits to either be combination circuits or sequential circuits. Any question? So 
if we say that transistors allows us to create flip-flops or switches, what are some of the states, right? We can say just like how you turn on and off the light, right? We can have it on, which is represent one in binary, off, which is zero. And at one, we would have 2.4 to 5 volts, positive volts. And then when it's off, it's going to drop down to close to zero or zero voltage. Sometimes this will also represent open and close as we were looking at open and close for the circuit. And that means that it would be voltage versus no voltage. Any question? Okay, so we know the elements of your processor, right? We talked about why transistors are important because of the logic gate and what gates actually does in our processor. And so it doesn't matter what brand that you're looking at or the model, right? Ultimately, the only difference in these are gonna be the type of instructions that they're able to receive, right? So like we talked about last time, the type of assembly language that's used to program these microprocessor. But when you break it down to the simplest level in how we build microprocessor, we really have to, we revert back to the components of the microprocessor, which are transistor diodes, capacitors, resistors, and occasional inductor. And those are the what makes a microprocessor. Okay. Okay. So we had stopped here. And so where it talks about between the, the N type and the P type, and I'm gonna differentiate these. And if you did the pre-class reading, when you look at the chapter and looked at the notes, you kind of have a little bit more understanding, right? I try to summarize it. Open circuit means that there's no voltage, yes. Okay, so I'll come back to, to your question shortly. Okay, so we talked about how the semiconductor material that would be dope for the drain region. And this, you would see that when you look up transistors, right, it's a lot of the pages are going to give you, you know, NPN or PNP. And so the structure, that's going to tell you how it's really designed for the drains region for MOSFET, okay? And in the logic gates, we need to really address the operator that we've been working with. And so, so far, I think we only did AND and OR, right, in the last uh, week. So when we work with these logical operator at the higher level, the gates are actually at work at the lower level in the processor. And so logic gates are your basic logical functions that are really the fundamental building blocks for your IC, your integrated circuits. This is how we're able to apply or even compute, and we will understand why, right? Like adding values or adding the, the two's complement, which is subtraction, multiplication, all the things that we do. We remember that the computer was really built for arithmetic in the, four, in the in 1940s, and it consistently continued to do so, even though it seemed more complex, but at the low level, it is performing arithmetic. So, we are working with the and, the logical and, the or, the not, the exclusive or, the not and, the not or, the exclusive not or, okay? 
So with that, we need to use these logical operator or your logic gates for performing complex operations like 3D gaming, right? VR, uh, like to be able to do analysis, machine learning. So the maximum of your logic gates in your IC is determined by the size of the chip and the size of your logic gates. And it really comes down to that, okay? So as we're looking at the smaller transistors, that would mean that it needs to have more complex, faster processors. So if you're looking at the count, when we talked about that at the beginning, when you, we need to have billions, so we need to really use more of the transistor to be able to compute more at the complex level, okay? Now, there was a question about for your circuit switch. So before we answer the next question, we already talked about there's N-type and the P-type, okay? and this is a slide from the publisher. I grabbed some of this and put it on my notes, but you know they depict that best on here. So I'm gonna to revert to this and, and talk to, uh, to you about this. So for your N type, this is when the gate has positive voltage, okay? And so that means that when it short circuits, it's gonna switch close, and so when the gate has zero voltage, it's gonna open, okay? So when it receives positive volts, it's gonna close. And when it has zero volts, when it drops to zero, the, the, the circuit is open. That's gonna be between A1 and two, okay? So gate zero, that's open. When for gate one, that means it's received positive, it, it's closed. This is for the N-type. For the P-type, okay, it's the opposite. So it, it is the complement of the N-type, okay? So when you have when you have a certain type of process, uh, transistor, it's going to say PNP, right? So it needs to have its complement with the combination of, right, the, the, the type of your MOS. So the P type is the complementary of the N type. When the gate has positive voltage between one and two, it's gonna open, okay? When the gate has zero voltage, short circuit between one and two, it's gonna close. So it is the opposite of the N type. So in general, your question is broad, right? We have to take a look at which type that we're, we're referring to. So in the circuits, it really depending for the, the type of MOS transistor to really represent when the gate is open or closed, okay? Other questions? So I touched a little bit on this, but this diagram shows you your digital values. So when you have the zero, right? Like we learned to convert binary. When you represent the zero at the analog value, that's between zero to 0 0.5, okay? So when we're saying that bit is off or it has zero, that just means that it receives zero volts or close to zero, because as you know, analog signal is never exactly that, right? It's not exact value, it would be a range. So we would be close to zero. So it's gonna drop down to close to zero. Then when we have a digital one is when it's between two, well, 2 2.4 volts to 2.9 volts. That means a digital one. But you said, wait a minute, you told me it's five volts, okay? So the properties of the transistor, they allow it to receive approximately three volts or higher, depending on your technology, what you need it for. Sometimes you would need more voltage 
depending on whether there's mechanical component, for example, your hard disk drive needs to have the mechanical component to really store the value on the platters, right, magnetically. So with that, what you have is when we represent the digital one, we're really referring to that could be positive five volts or 3.3 volts or 2.9 volts or 1.1 volts. In the industry, you are mostly going to see microcontrollers and embedded system in this area between 3.3 volts and 5 volts. Okay. I know some of you are have toy with Arduino, right? So this is a microcontroller and this is used for educational purpose. It teaches integrated circuits, circuits really well and how to program it in C. Most microcontroller in the industry use the C because it's easy to integrate. There are great libraries to be able to adapt. And at the low level, they program this in assembly. So when you plug things in, it's able to recognize Right, the processor is able to determine which pin you're connecting it to. And so it will process the logical right, uh, operation for your, your program. But if you look at this side, and this is the reason why I'm showing you this, this is a microcontroller, Arduino Uno, right? You would see that to really turn things on, like my LED or you know, create this as an alarm system, I need to give it some kind of volts. So when I program, my program is in C, but it needs to convert that back into analog signal to be able to output that as a light, a sound, a beep, whatever it is, okay? And so you would see that it's 3.3 volts, 5 volts, and then they're a ground, right? They're connection. Now, if you use like a battery to really power the Arduino, which is nine volts, you have to kind of regulate that because all it really needs is between 3.3 .3 and a five volts to really output something, right? And same otherwise in a lot of the areas for your PC, your computer, or when we're looking at embedded system, right? Which is a Raspberry Pi. The difference between this one and the microcontroller is embedded system use some form of interface with the management capability, like an operating system, hence embedded Linux, right? But when you're looking at the digital circuitry for output, you are seeing the same thing, five volts for power connection, 3.3 volts for power connection. So if I need to power an LED, I simply connect the positive connection here and a ground, right? Or if I need to, like, let's say, connect a speaker, I can connect a five volt and a ground. So this kind of tying back to really what we were talking about in the type of voltage that needs to go in to really drive the digital one and the zero voltage when it pulls it down, right? To be able to get for the ground level. So to answer the next question, the difference between your N type and the P type for MOS transistors, right? Is when you, when you look at the N type, the gate, when it has positive voltage, short circuits between the two terminal, which is your input, it will cause it to close, okay? But when it has zero voltage, it's gonna open. And N-type is attached to ground, which pulls the voltage down when the input is one. So when you have one of the input is one, right? as it is a positive voltage, it's going to close. And when it pulls down to zero, it's going to reopen or open the terminal or the switch. Okay. So it's when it, so when you give it a one as an input, it's going to close. And then as it pulls down to almost zero volts, it's going to open.
for the P type, which is the opposite, it is a complementary of the N type. When the gate has a positive voltage, the circuit is open between one and two. But when it gets a zero voltage, when it drops down to zero, it's going to close. The switch is closed. It is attached to positive voltage where it's going to pull the output voltage up when the input is zero. So when you have zero voltage, right, it's going to pull that up and that's attached to the positive voltage. And so make sure that we understand the difference between the, these two. So with that said, what are the voltage ranges for zero and ones in digital logic structure? Your zero is gonna give you the range between zero to 0 0.5 volts. And your digital one has the analog value range between 2.4 to 2.9 volts. We can go to 3.3 and 5, like I said. Uh, yeah, you can put it in your own word if that's easy for you to understand. The whole point in your assignment is really to help you understand, as I explain it, a good way to review reference for your quiz and future exam, but your assignments are for you, right? Um, it's a way for you to go back and be able to understand the information. So if you want to put it verbatim as that helps you, that's fine. If you wanna summarize it, that's okay. As long as it makes sense and it's clear to you, okay? So we talked about the digital one for the voltage range in analog, and we typically would see these values. So don't be surprised, right? If, if it's not exactly three volts, it's higher than three volts. You're welcome. Remember that we need to supply power source to components, right, within. So it doesn't need, it, and it's not exactly the value as you know that your current flow is never exact, okay? So you would have approximate or the range. Now, if you give it too much power, you can also fry it, right? Um, as when I did camp one year and I was showing them how to use the Arduino um, and with, when you use battery, that's nine volts, it needs to, and you only need a five volt to really do something right, like rotate, um, if you're looking at a drone, right, for the blades, it's only going to need about five volts for that. So if you supply a lot of the, the voltage and you don't regulate it, what's going to happen is it's going to have a huge search through and you're going to end up fr frying that portion or actually the board itself. So we would use resistor to be able to control the ohm and, and things like that. So, okay. But you get the idea for the range, and this is going to come up for the final and the quiz. Question. So before we go to the next few questions, um, I want to come back and talk about like when we were adding the binary, uh, how these digital bits really play into what we talked about today, which is your gates and your transistors. Okay, so let's come back to this. So where we left off was we talked about the size, the physical size on how we would need to really fit, right? Millions or billions of your transistor into your microprocessor for storage mostly um, and computation, your AOU, okay? Then 
in the next part, it explains what a decoder is. And it, when you learn programming, a lot of times they talk about fetch, decode, right? And then to be able to execute the instructions. And we touch a little bit on that where I mentioned there's priority. We're gonna come back to that later on, okay? So here, the decoder is really a circuit that changes the code into what we see as electrical signal. It is a way that we would reverse the encoding, okay? And we use encoding for a lot of the things that would be understood as for humans, right? For example, UTF-8 is an encoding system um, or ASCII is an own encoding system so that can output text. So a common decoder that we would see is a line decoder. And what that does is it's gonna make everything into a binary value where it would decode your data lines. Right, so let's say I have two input and that's considered a, a, a data input. Um, I can give it a value, right? Everything that you type, you, you know, as you save, it saves it as numerical values in binary, right? Whenever you open your files, it needs to pull everything back and convert it to something that it can output as text and image for you. But ultimately the computers store everything in numerical value. So when we, when we store things or when we have instructions, what that does is it's going to be in binary value. It's going to decode it for the data line. That's going to be the bus. And it's going to apply your logic, right, to be able to have the computation that you need. So for example, write into a flash drive, uh, open up a file, be able to access web pages, things like that, right? It needs to really decode and break it down ultimately to the electrical signal. So that way it would be able to have the instruction for your monitor, your keyboard, your mouse, your network interface adapter, right? Wi-Fi or your NIC regularly to be able to connect and present to you at a higher level as an application. So when we look at this, we refer back to what we would see with logical operator, the and, the or, the not, right? And in some cases, we don't just have two input. We might have more than two input. We would have, let's say three or four input. So, if we're only dealing with like the and, right? A and B is true, then do this. That's not always the case. We compute at complex level, so we need to be able to have more than two input. And in the not, there's only one input, right? So you would have X and Y or A and B, A or B, right? So that would introduce what we call a MUX or a multiplexer. A multiplexer is a combinational logical circuit. This is a way that we can have several input lines, not just two. So we can combine mul multiple logical operators or logic circuits to have multiple input and a single output. So the operation of this is to be able to send one or more analog signal through a common line at different or the same speed and have one output, okay? So this is considered, a multiplexer is considered what we call a combinational logical circuit that allows you to switch across multiple inputs to have one common output. So what does it look like? It would look like this. I have input one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, a hundred, right? What it does is it's able to switch across these input and produce only one output here. 
And this is an example using the rotary switch or the wafer switch, which is, you know, a combinational logical circuit. So it's also known as your data selector as it selects the input for the data on the data line. Okay. So when you see this, often that it would be constructed as an analog switch in the integrated circuits, mechanical selector. I know some of you are going to get into computer engineering where you would work with this a little bit closer or even electrical engineering, right? Um, and in computer science, we have to really understand what type of components that we are working with outside of just writing programs for it, right? We have to see what it sees, how it understands things. Okay. So a multiplexer, make sure that we know that it is a combinational logic circuit. It's a way that to switch across multiple inputs or select the type of data that is being inputted to output one, okay? To have one output, like this big picture. Any question? Okay, so now let's talk about adders. So last week we learned how to add binary after we convert it, right? And we work with carry. When you take a one, add with the one, you would have a carry. And so, so in a computer, there's no magical space that exists where things just float around and be able to bring it to the next column, right? We really have to implement a way that there would be a circuit to really represent that output in a carry, a carry value. It needs to place it somewhere to be able to use it for computation. So a binary adders are circuits. They are consist of two types, half adders and a full adder. When you have a half adder, that is where your value, your sum, right? So if I take a one, add it with the one, I have a zero with the one carry, right? Carry to the next column. So I need to have a circuit to be able to perform that output for the zero and, an, and another way to represent what that one carry to the next column, how it's gonna compute that, how it's gonna calculate that. So a half adder is where that zero is and a full adder is the carry. This is where they would tell you that your carry out, right, is where we would be able to implement your binary adder as the carry into the next column, okay? So if I have a value and a value, it converts that into binary, right? It gives you the half adder. This, is, this circuit is gonna allow you to have the sum and the carry, right, to be added in the next value on the column, right? As we, we did that manually, we would handle it with the, the, the adding value at the top, right? And then get the sum and then be able to add it again. So we really design the, the computer to perform what we normally do, right? As human. Now, how do they really design that? For your sum, the binary addition really resemble what we would see as an exclusive OR gates. Okay, so your adders are really exclusive OR gates. If you're looking at, if I have a value that's a one added with a one, I have a zero with a carry. So if they create it as an exclusive OR gates, they're able to implement the sum, which is the half adder, along with the AND gate to be able to have the carry. So to really handle how we add binary, it is combined 
with the exclusive or and the end gate to handle the carry and the sum for your output. And that's what ultimately, that's what it is. Any question? Okay, no question. So here it tells you a half adder, right? That's a way for us to operate the two binary digits. It produced a sum and a carry value because we always expect, right? It could be both on to have the sum and the carry one. Okay, so that's what a binary adder is. And the, on the circuit side, that's what it is. Okay. So coming back here, let's identify your logic gates. And if those of you who took my CS7 or currently in my CS7, some of this is familiar to you, right? There's a slight difference between this class and the other class. I focus a little bit more on the architecture in this class versus discrete math for the other class. Okay, so let's start with five. When you, sometimes you, most of the time, you are going to get a diagram like this, right? You have to determine which logic gate that is. And for the test, you need to do the same. I want you to leave this class at least knowing the basic. So that way, when you go and take the, the next level class, you would understand how to read your, your gates diagram and how to be able to write your assembly program. Okay, so this has two input and one output. This is an AND gate. The, re the way that I remember it, it's a D shape. And D is an AND. Okay. In C++, it's a double ampersand. Okay. In other languages, you just type out AND, A-N-D, right, depending on the syntax. But this is an AND gate. So for the quiz and the exam, I'm going to give you a, an image of a gate and you have to tell me which one it is. So remember, and has a D and it's the D shape. Question. B, this is an OR gate or OR, logical operator. It has two input and one output, I would say A or B, right? And it's gonna produce. So remember that for the OR rule, anytime that there's a one, anytime that it's true, the output is true. For the AND, anytime there's a false, the output is false, okay? And for the OR in C++, we're familiar with the double pipe, okay? Any question? And so for the OR, it looks more like an arrow, right? Compared to the AND that looks like a D. Now, there are other form of diagrams out there, but this is a common one that you're gonna see. And then for the knot. Okay, that will be the exclamation point in C++. And not only requires one input. So if I say the input is A, not A is the opposite, right? That's the one complement. So if I have it on here, one, not on is off, zero. And the way that we draw this, it is a sharp arrow, but you always remember that there's always a bubble. Whenever that you see a small little bubble, that indicates that it is not. Okay. Not is the only operator that requires a unary input, one input. All the others have two input on the data lines. Then for the next one, D, this is an OR with a NOT, right? So that's going to be, it's going to operate the OR and then it's knotted. So it's a NOR, not OR, 
you refer to earlier right diagram we said it's a it's it's not a sharp arrow it's a bold arrow right it's the arrow shape that's an or and then you have the bubble that's a not so we would say not or a not or b So to handle this mathematically, we OR these input and then we NOT it. That's the second step. That's why it's drawn this way, OR, NOT. It's not the other way around, okay? We OR it and then we NOT it before we output. And then similarly for the next one, this is a D shape. So we know that is an AND, A and B, and then NOT. So NAN. So we would have two input for the AND. And once we have the, the values AND together, we would NOT it for the output, single output. Any question? I think a lot of the programming talk about the computer science concept in this class focus specifically on our org 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 organizational architecture. So we're specifically looking at the processor and then we're going to talk about like different law, like Moore's law. You, you heard a little bit of that earlier. And then we're going to touch on De Morgan's law. So the PowerPoint presentation from the text, or if you read the chapter itself, it really touches on this specifically, right, throughout the chapter. Any question? Okay, so make sure that we know how to look at the gates and determine what kind of operator that is. Okay, and so some of this, you know, there's additional information about the NAND gate. Sometimes it's drawn this way in the true table in your presentation for chapter three. Um, there you go, right? So we would have a multiplexer where you would have more than two inputs. So your MUX, like this. So sometimes you would have like not and, and then an or. So when you have the combination of and, you would have the or output. So here is where the De Morgan's law piece comes in. It tells you here that converting and to or, right, would not is considered the following gate. Okay. So when we convert and to or, we would invert the inputs and the output. So for the input, we would invert it, which is not, right? So if I have A, I would have not A. If I have B, I would have not b for the invert and then i and those not values together and for the output i gotta flip it back so i nod it back and that's going to be equivalent to or so when we make it from and to or we would need to do those so not the inputs and them together then not before we output So really explaining the De Morgan's law for your logic. And you can read about the theorem. So here I'm giving you the summarized version, okay? So there are two theorems. Number one, De, Mor De Morgan's law first theorem proves that when two or more input variables when they're and together and negated, which is NAND, they're equivalent to OR 
of the complements of the individual variable, which is what you see in that diagram. We inverted the inputs, we end them together, and then we invert it before we output. So that's the first part of the Morgan's law, which is the equivalent of NAND function will be the negative OR function. And so in the example that we see, we only have two inputs, right? We are not using more than two inputs. So this is a way that we can look at the Morgan's law, how it applied to the logic circuits in our integrated circuit system. Alternatively, part two, if there are two or more variables not or together, it is the same as the two variable inverted or complement and and. So it's the opposite, right? While the second theorem states that two or more variable nan together is the same as two terms inverted and or. So when you replace it with the or operator and the and operator, not all or the n operators with the or operators. So that means that the first theorem said that when I NAN the values together, it's equivalent to the negative or. Well, when I NOR the variables together, it is the inverted n. Okay, that's the second part of the Morgan's law. And this is the essential right, element that plays into your computer science and microprocessor. Okay, so the diagram would look like this. Any question? Okay, so make sure we know De Morgan's law for the quiz and the final exam. All right. So my intention is to make sure that you understand this is why I'm doing this, not just to give you an answer. So if you're not clear about something, please ask. If you feel like you want to stay on later and ask, that's fine. Or you can send me an email if you want to privately ask. Okay. All right, I'm gonna move on. Okay, so let's do some basic exercises together, right? We did the and or, or last time in our lab one. I wanna make sure that you understand how to use nan and nor. Okay, so for number seven, it tells you to determine the output giving given this input, not and this input. So the first step is to be able to take these values and and them together. Okay, so I, to review, and if you're not sure, you can also go back to the lab. So for the and rules, zero and zero is zero zero and one is zero. Anytime that you have a zero, you get a zero as the output, false, right? One and zero is zero. One and one is one. So the first step is to end these guys together. So zero and one is zero. One and one is one. 
one and zero is zero. One and one is one. Zero and one is zero. One and zero is zero. This is not adding, it's and, right? Zero and one is zero. Anytime we have a zero in the mix, any either input, we're gonna get a zero, right? That's the rule. One and zero is a zero. We're not done, that's step one, right? This asks us to not and, so we and them first, and then we apply the next operator, which is the not. So once you have the output for the and, you gotta use the not operator, which is you're gonna flip the bits, right? The zero becomes the one. So zero becomes the one. The next zero becomes the one. The next zero becomes the one. The fourth zero becomes the one. The one here becomes the zero. The one becomes the zero and the last zero on the right side, which is the least significant bit, becomes a one. And so this is your output, you're not in. And of course you can use a true table, but if you know how to operate it manually, that's the way that we write the gate, right? We and and we not for name. So going back to De Morgan's law, he's saying that when you NAND them together, you're and when you inverted the the inputs and NAND them together, that's equivalent to the OR. Or if you NAND the values together, that's equivalent to the inverted OR as the output. Okay, then we continue for 7b, same process. If you given this value in binary, you're gonna NAND it, not AND it with the next value. The first step is to compute the AND. So zero and one is zero, right? Zero and one again is zero. Zero and zero is zero. One and zero is zero. One and zero is zero. Zero and one is zero. Anytime we have a zero in the mix for n, it's output zero. One and one is one. And one and one is one. So this is the n output. Then we gotta apply the not operator. So we flip the bits. The one becomes the zero. The next one becomes a zero. The zero becomes the ones and the rest, all the zeros flip the bits. So the opposite of that bit is one. So that will be your output for 7b. So we need to know how to do this. You will have question on quiz and exam to be able to find the output for NAN, NOR, and or not. Okay, your operators. Any question? All right, now we're going to go to C, which is where we're going to use not or. So for 7C, you're given this binary value, and we need to operate not or with the next binary value. So just like what we did with the NAN, we're going to operate the or for the two inputs. And then after that, we're going to not the 
output from the OR to get the final output, your result. So step one, we're going to OR. And remember the OR rule. Zero or zero is zero. Zero or one is one. One or zero is one. One or one is one. Anytime that you have a one, you're going to have a one or a one from the one of the inputs or both of the input, you're going to have a one as the output. Anytime that it's true in any of the input, you have a true as output. So coming back here, we're going to start from the right. One or zero is going to be one because I have this one from the input. It's going to give me one as the output. One or one is one. One or zero is one. One or zero is one. Zero or one is one. Zero or zero is zero. Zero or one is one. One or one is one. And that is just for the or. Now we've got to handle the not from the nor, right? So we're going to take the output from the OR and apply the NOT operator. So we're going to flip the bits. One becomes the zero, one becomes the zero. The next zero here becomes the one. And then the one becomes a zero. And the rest of the ones become zeros. Question. Now, of course, I can use a calculator, right? I showed you guys how to use your calculator like this. So you click the mode and you use the programmer. Let's say that I input the, the bin, which is binary, right? You put in the values and you can change this to be the size that you want to see. So let's say I can put it into a byte, which is the, the smallest, eight bits. Now on here, you're, see how there's a little gate symbol? You're gonna click bitwise, and this is where you're gonna be able to use your operator. There's exclusive or, the NAND, the NOR, the NOT. So this is a good way to check your answer if you're doing it manually. Now, you're not going to have this for the quiz or the test. I mean, the test exam, mostly the quiz, you can, you can use your calculator, but not the final exam. Okay, so I want to make sure that you know the step for the process to solve. Okay, but you can also use Bitwise to check, which is this option right here. Under the programmer mode. And then you can also do bit shift. So when you use your IDE, right, like VS Code or Visual Studio uh, Community. Um, a lot of the IDE or Python shell, um, all the IDE, it's able to handle computation and logical operator as long as you tell it the input and the output, right? Because your processor is a calculator and it only adds, we'll learn why soon. <laughs> Okay, so you need to solve for D as I went over the process. So we take these, this value or with this value, get the output and then not it, right? That's the next step. Then you get your final result. Any question? Okay, so let's come back to some of the theory now and, and we would tie everything up, right? You saw how to come to calculate this with the operators. We talked about De Morgan's law.
Let's come back to some of the things that we talked about earlier. So for question eight, ask you, what is the purpose of a decoder in the logical function? And as it's stated on your notes, it is a circuit that changes code into signals. It's called the decoder is because it reversed the encoding. And we would use different encoding system for different purposes. Some of it we see for text, some of it, it could be from analog to digital signal. And then when you're looking at data encapsulation and decapsulation, you would see some of that too, right? So for example, when I use my smartphone, which is connected to the wireless network, could be my mobile network or my home network. When I make a phone call, my voice is in analog signal. And in order to transmit your conversation, my voice to the recipient who's receiving the call, it needs to convert that signal into digital signal. As we are using all our, all our networks now is digital network, as you know, right? So when your, when your conversation is sent to the cell tower, which is then sent through the network to the, the receiver, the re, you know, when you're making a phone call, that data is already being sent as the digital. So your phone, what it does is it takes your analog, which is your voice in waves, convert it, right? It is a way to change it into signal, convert it, and then transmit it through the network as zero and ones in packets. And if you're taking my networking class, I always talk about things don't arrive all in order, right? So when it gets to recipient on the recipient phone, it's going to convert it back. So it's going to switch your digital signal as data, then change it back into analog, which is what you hear on the speaker as voice. And that happens instantaneously. It has to happen fast. So that way there's no lag, right? The only time that you face lag is when the network has issues, traffic, just like how we deal with you know, traffic on the 91 freeway, right? Everybody slows down. So in the case of there's a, a delay, it's usually just because there's a lot of traffic on the network. And now they have ways to be able to divert traffic and control flow in the network. So this is a way that you do see, right? How encoding and decoding actually works where it does a convert. And there's a specific processor or components of the processor that handles that, okay? Depending on the type of your uh, embedded system for your smartphones and things like that. And we can use our computer the same way. Your smartphone is just a, a smaller scale of that, right? All right, for number nine, it asks you to describe the purpose of multiplexer in the logical function. And we mentioned that MUX, is they are all digital circuits that is made of high-speed logic gates. This is used to switch digital data or binary data. Can be analog types using transistors, MOSFETs, or relays. We switch one of the voltage or current inputs through a single output. So it's going to be able to switch across a range of inputs, right, for the multiplexer compared to two input that you would see in your simple logic gate. So what you would have is multiplexer is a way that we can have a combination of gates. So that way it's able to switch across many inputs to produce one single output. Okay, for 10, we need to explain the purpose of binary adder, full adder, and in digital logic structures. So binary adders, as mentioned in 
my explanation and also the notes earlier, they are arithmetic circuits. It comes with half adder or full adder. This is used to add binary digits together. They are combinational logic circuit, which can be constructed using basic logic gates between two or so that way we can add two or more binary numbers. So when you tell your system, let's say that you're doing your math homework, right, for algebra or calculus or whatever, or you simply calculate your, your fi finance for the month, right? We can say, let's say $200 plus 200 would be $400. So when you input the 200, add it with the 200 on the calculator on your computer, Right, all of that converts to binary and it would use the uh, binary adders to be able to handle right, the binary digits adding together and with the carry. So a basic binary adder circuit can be made up of and and exclusive OR gates. So these two gates are work are together to be able to create your binary adder circuit, which allows us to add the binary digits together. So binary adders at the gates level is the AND and exclusive OR. So now I think the term combination and sequential circuits come up a lot. And I think we're going to re also revisit this next week as well. Okay. So in the slides, it touches on it, but I wanted to give you one question that really differentiate between the two so you can understand. Describe the difference between combinational and sequential circuits. So your combinational circuits will always have the same will give the same output as the given set of input. So an example of this is the adder always generate the sum and carry, which we talked about in the last question, regardless of the previous input. So you're always going to consistently have the same output if you're using the same set of inputs that's combinational. For your sequential circuit, it stores the information and its output depends on what is stored. And this is what you see in your state machine, plus the input. So when we save our file, so for example, I have a blank document to start. I added a few lines on my document. I save it to the system that the, my output is really depending on the stored information or the state of my file, correct? So in the sequential circuit, what you see is a given input might produce different output depending on what is already stored. So an example of this is when you go to a ticket counter and you would be able to go forward by pushing the button. So the output is really depending on the previous state. Now, why is sequential circuit used? This is really a way that we would be able to build what we see with state machines or storage in general. Okay, the state of your storage is what's stored, of course. Any question?
Okay, so make sure we know the difference between sequential and combinational. As we define through, right, like binary adders, combinational, some of the circuits are combinational. And so with that, we would then, uh, let me see if I can find, yeah. So when you go to, if you use the slides, you would see that in the latest slides here for, for combinational logic. They are very brief in the slides, so I hope to give you a little bit more when, you know, if you want to write verbatim, that's fine. It's really to help you understand more than anything. Okay. Or if it's easier for you to summarize so you can remember, that's fine too. Okay, we're almost done. Hang tight. We just have like a couple more to go. A second. Oops. So I, this is what I use for my seven class. I added it on your page so you can have a little bit more understanding for groups. Okay. Um, so now we are going to define the purpose of RS latch in the storage element. And so the way that they named this for storage, and this is concerning like the architecture that we're working with. RS latch really represent reset, which is clear and set, okay? Reset is exactly what it means. It means clear the element back to zero and set is to set a value, give it a one. So to really implement this is really a way for us to introduce value or clear the value from the storage. That's ultimately what it is. RS latch, that's for your storage element, reset or set, and that's what it means. Any question? Okay, no question. So storage memory, you can also use this PowerPoint, right? There's some added details in that if you wanted to view it. Um, that's where RS latch comes from. And if you've read the chapter, you probably got that too. Just the slides is a summarized version of the chapter. Okay. So now we need to have a multi-bit representation because the reason why I go over this is when you start writing instruction starting this week lab and forward, you are going to have your instructions in a certain part of your word, okay? So a word is 16 bits. 
from a certain bit to a certain bit, we are going to be able to have instructions. From a certain bit to a certain bit, we are going to use, um, you know, like let's say values, right, or offset. So there are certain part of a word size that we can use for data, and there are certain part of the the word size that we can use for instructions, and that's very, that's very specific to assembly okay um so this is a way that we want to be able to denote your bit representation okay so what i did was i highlighted the bits and we want to go from left to right and we want to start so we know that this is the first bit right and we're going to go from 0 to 15. So what we want to do is we are going to denote it from left to right, bit to bit, from the left to the right. And we're going to say what that equals to. So if I'm only concerned, so this is a 16-bit word, right? So when we say a word for LC3, uh, Microsoft ASM, there are many assembly language refer to a word as 16 bits, okay? So that's basically a unit to represent storage of data, right? We know that that will make up two bytes, which is a byte is eight bits. So two times eight gives you 16. So if we only care about the highlighted area, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to count from the right to left. Okay, so if I start here at zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's where my highlighted area start. So I'm gonna go from bit 10 to bit 15 or bit 15 to bit 10. So in the square bracket, you would say that from 15 to bit 10, this is the value, which is the highlighted value. So, and that could represent something, right? Down the line, we're going to see that there are a certain section of a word that would represent your instruction. And then maybe the rest of it would represent offset or label or something like that. So what this tells you is from bit 10 to bit 15 in a 16-bit word, right? That's the value, which is the highlighted value here. So for B, if I'm only concerned about these bits, I start with the right. This is zero, right? Count left. One, two, three, four, five. So these five bits have this value. So from zero to five, that's the value, which is the highlighted value here. The, the reason why we spend time on this is down the line when you also look the breakdown for your instructions, right? The book and the notes and a lot of the you know available resources they're going to write it this way they're going to say bit 0 to 5 is offset or bit you know 12 to 15 is this and you have to know what that is okay so this is just the position of your bits in a word and the value that it, they represent okay Any question? So on the left, we would note that position first, and then we use a colon, and then the right, which is where we start with the highlighted area. Okay, in the book, they box it, but I didn't want to box it, so I just want to highlight it for you. All right, C, last one or before 14, um, I wanted to denote the bit positions for that value 
right? Again, starting from the right, one, two, three, four, five. Let's start with bit five, four, or I'm sorry, zero, one, two, three, four. So bit four, and then we count it forward, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So between four to ten, so you would do ten colon four, and that's the value, the highlighted value. So what we're doing here is just telling the location of the bit. Exactly. Because, yeah, in the future, we have to read it and see like, oh, you know, for example, the first four bits, your instruction or five bits, is your instruction. You have to know how it's represented because it can get confusing for people. So I wanted to spend time to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the position of the bit. So it's saying between bit four and 10, right? This is the value. And also on the simulator, right? You're gonna see the binary file and you would see, or on the simulator, you would see like the binary values. So everything is in Word, 16 bits. Any question? All right. So in the presentation, after it talks about, um, let me see if I have, We're going to answer one more and then we'll call it a night. Oh, these are just the last eight stuff. But anyway, let me break it down for you real quick. So I think um, many of you probably read or heard or you know explored concept with finite machine finite state machine right so for 14 I asked you to discuss the properties of the finite state machine and keep in mind that this is just some highlighted property of your finite state machine so some of the the characteristics for the finite state machine you should remember that a finite number of the state consists of finite number that is externally for external inputs and output. So that means that it has explicit specification for all state transition. And with that, the specification is deter, it's gonna use to determine each external output value described based on your state diagram. So a good example for this is whenever that you go through the, the turnstile or let's think about vending machine. A vending machine, um, for most of you know, right, you have options to pick. And when you push, when you insert your coin or use your charge card, you apply some kind of value to that machine so that way it's going to be able to rotate or dispense the product. So with that, when you introduce some form of input, right, it's going to externally generate an output value depending on the trigger for the input. Okay. Or when you go to like a, a, an amusement park, they give you a wristband, right? 
um, or a ticket, when you scan your ticket, it rotates the wheel so you can enter the park. And so with that, what that is, is that's gonna be an input trigger that allows the state to transition. So we need to be able to have some form of output based on each of the state. In the vending machine, your input is not just the dollars or the coins or the charge card, it's also your selection. So when you press like option D1, for example, and that product, they rotate the wheel and be able to, to drop, that really is, we are applying input trigger to be able to transition and give you the output. But depending on your input selection, that's gonna give you the transition for the state. And I'm only using a vending machine as a simplest, you know, base example and don't make it where it would be completely like a, a finite state machine. But in that, what you would see is your output is always going to be associated with a specific state or the transition. So how does this play back to what we were talking about with sequential logic and combinational logic? Your combinational logic is going to be used to determine the output for the next state. And your state transition is going to be per clock cycle. Okay. So how does it know what state to transition to next? Well, your storage. What information is stored? We just talked about that, right? where it's going to revert back to the data or the information that's stored is going to be used to represent that state, which is maintained in the storage. So as you can see, storage is a key to your state machine. Without it, it would not be able to have any form of reference for data for trigger along with you know, output because it won't be able to have any information for its state. Okay. Yes, I will try to push it on YouTube tomorrow or tonight. If I have time or it converts it quickly enough, I will link it tonight, um, but latest tomorrow. So this is going to go up. I have my prior lecture, but every semester I try to add a little bit more because I assess based on what student didn't understand in the last semester and I try to add a couple of things when I lecture. So yes, it will go up, okay? But I can turn on the one from the prior semester. Question. Okay. So I highly recommend go back. If you haven't read the chapter, read the chapter. It's gonna help gel things together because some of this might be new or review, whatever it is. This is a little bit more higher level concept. So, but very core to your computer science, right? We are talking about the CPU and storage. Um, okay, other, any concern or question? All right, so now, um, since I have a tiny bit of time, I'm just gonna tell you what we're gonna be doing Thursday. I know that I posted this, some of you probably checked it out. We are gonna program in LC3, okay? At first, it's gonna look very foreign and very strange. Um, some of you probably, if you took digital logic or learn about it somewhere before, or you took assembly before, great, right? This will be review. And if you learn it in another assembly language, this is easier, okay? Um, I will talk a little bit about LC3. I will walk you through the exercises. We are going to do hello world and assembly, just like all the other programming languages, right? When you learn. Some of the challenges that the student have is to understand the numerical value that the computer store compared to what we see as human. Because we always think about a zero is a zero. So when you type in a zero, you assume that it is a zero, but it is not, okay? 
a text zero is not a true zero. A text zero has been encoded. And in LC3, we are using ASCII. So the difference or the offset in that is the hex value, which is why we spent time working with hex last week. Okay, so I'll touch a little bit more and explain this. So when you type in a one, a two, a three, or four, or five on your keyboard, it is then converted to hexadecimal or binary ultimately, right? And you have to have an offset. Remember, we spend a lot of time looking at decimal converting to binary, but not only that, when you are encoding, it's applying a whole set of numerical system to that value. Okay, so the computer has to take that, right? It's like using the dictionary to translate between English and Spanish. You have to find a way to convert it so that way this, the computer can understand. So what we see in text is not exactly the numerical value that's stored, okay? So keep in mind, that's very important, okay? I put a little note of that because you know, the question always comes up about it. I wanted to make sure that it's clear, especially when we're doing the later exercises. So what you can do is you can preview it and it's always a good practice before Thursday for every week from now until week 11 or so to be able to take a look at the lab. Sometimes we do very long lab. At the end, we're gonna write stacks in the assembly. So it's gonna be a bit. But these are tiny, small programs. I will show you how you can comment, how you can assemble your program, how you be able to run your program to add the values together, right? Converting between ASCII and your hexadecimal, how to be able to um, make it back. So you change it back so you can display ASCII value on your console because you guys love input and output. I see that in every single class. I see some chat question. So will, will I be able to do this on the Mac, right? Um, I think for those of you who attended the first session, um, and if you miss it, because sometimes I say it earlier in the session. So if you click on module on Canvas, there is a page called LC3 resources. This is where you're gonna be able to find your simulator, okay? It is in the first module, it's part of your course information. You click the LC3 resources, right? For your Windows people, download, right? Click this link and then you'll be able to download your e executable, okay? Then when you unzip it, it's gonna put it on your C drive, not on your desktop. So you can take it from your C drive it's gonna look like um, I have it. I put it on my on my my secondary storage. So I have a, a CS11 folder, and then it's gonna look like this. So when you unzip it, it has an LC3 folder, and then we have an editor and we have a simulator. Okay, so you just need to download, unzip, and you're good. Now, if you're using McAfee or some type of anti-malware, sometimes it doesn't just let you you know, uh, unzip or run the executable, just make sure that you unblock it. So just configure your anti-malware or security software. All right, back to the page. Mac, on the bottom of your LC3 resources, there are online simulator and also how there is how to use the simulator for the PC people, okay? But I will walk you through on how to use it. So if for those of you who are using like a Chromebook where you can't install or Mac, right? iMac or MacBook, you can select one of those. So this is your simulator. It's an online simulator. You can use this on Windows too. The downfall in this is it is okay, there are some components on here that is the same as your regular simulator. It doesn't always have all the extra details, but you can also clear and you can also add things. So, you know, the output, your output console is right here. 
right? And then you can step to the program. You can run the program after you assemble. So assembly, the step is that you, you, you use the editor to write your program, just like any programming language. You are gonna use an assembler to assemble your program. It's kind of like how you compile your program in C++ or Java, right? For those of you who took my Java class or took Java, you have to compile the Java file, right? Um, to And then after that, you can run the file. So assembly language, you have to assemble, right? Your, your code. And then after that, you run. Similar process to what you've seen with compiler, okay? Now, some assembly language use C compiler. You just have to link the, the language package with it and it's able to you know correlate the language to c and then be able to compile it so it uses a compiler like some arm arm 64 does that um but in this one you don't need to use like compiler okay so i will walk you through on how to use this but again you will be able to find the links here okay so hope i answer your question Okay. Yep, not a problem. Any other questions? All right. So check out the lab. Okay, take a look at it. If you have, you need to install, you can install, or you need to use the simulator, kind of familiarize yourself with it, play with it. Um, you can also type in your code. The downside with the online simulator is you can't save it. So what I will show you how you can save your file and then copy and paste it. But, um, you know, it doesn't really have a way that you can cloud save it. I haven't seen one option yet, but there's some GitHub stuff. Yeah, feel free to create this card or if you want to have a conversation. Um, I see the Windows version, but I see a Mac for LC3. So I just answered that question. So a Mac, you're not gonna be able to download. You're gonna use an online simulator. Using the links here on LC3 resources page, okay? So your simulator is online for Mac or Chromebook. And then if you're using Windows, you can run the executable. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording.